Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an impressionist realist painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde J.K.L. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, botanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrative hand in watercolor, pen and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. Welcome to the Artist Friends Podcast. This is Clyde J. Kale, and it's on a Tuesday this week, Tuesday, June the 9th, and I am here with my two best artist friends, Constance and Diane. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everyone. Hello, Constance. Hi, Clyde. Hello, Diane. Hello, everybody. All right. Welcome. Welcome to the show this week. Okay. The recommended videos, and for our listeners who want to follow along, go to www.talkartpodcast.com, and you'll see the links there for the videos. You may want to get yourself a cold beverage because this is going to be a long podcast this week. We're going to try to get through the uh, 12 keys to creating master art or creating great paintings by Stephen Bauman. But before we get that started, I want to briefly talk about um, a video from Rafi. And this video, uh, the reason why I recommend it, because a conversation that we had with uh, Constance uh, several weeks ago, maybe several months ago, and we were talking about, you know, the story behind our artwork and the meaning of our art. And Constance said, I don't have any meaning behind my art. I just want to create something. That's what Rafi talks about. You don't necessarily have to have a meaning behind your art. Constance, you want to expand on that a little bit? Tell us what you do and and when you just decide you want to create something. Well, I just uh, put up a still life on the dresser over here and try to make a good job of it. (laughs) You know, you have to set it up. It takes you a little while to set up the, the still life and then, you know, get to do, go through all the stages of getting it ready to paint. So, um, so you kind of, so you kind of agree with what uh, Rafi says that you don't necessarily have to have a meaning or a story behind your art, right? No, I don't think so. I think you know, like we analyze all the art from the last century and beyond. I think that in the future, if our art is analyzed they will try to analyze it themselves and they probably won't even care about the meaning behind it you know pretty much unless you have a certain thing that you paint and you're that kind of painter i'm the kind of painter who likes to just make pretty paintings i like for it to be nice when i look at it i like i have only done a few that were kind of hard to look at because of the way i was feeling or something 
So, um, but most of the time, I like for it to just be a pretty painting, whether it's abstract, still life, landscape, just a nice, pleasing painting to look at. Diane, you want to add anything to this? What do you think about Rafi's opinion? I don't. I don't necessarily think it has to have a meaning. I mean, I don't think about that really when I'm getting ready to paint something. Usually, unless it's something specific. Um, but most of the time, it's more about a feeling or um, something that appeals to me for some reason, whether whether it's the way the light's hitting on something or, um, you know, something like the ocean means something to me from my childhood or, you know, things like that. But yeah, not necessarily, um, there's not necessarily a story or something specific sometimes. It's just... Um, yeah, it's just based on the feeling that, you know, I have to get it on canvas. I really liked the way in his video, uh, with his discussion, the way he came across there, he used, uh, you know, he says a lot of uh, meanings and stories and expressions. This is all, like Constance said, uh, something that the uh, uh, art, so-called art specialists in the art world and the hoity-toity, you know, people in the art, in the art world apply, like Van Gogh. He says, you know, they go in the elaborate thinking of, of explaining why he painted sunflowers. When in actual in reality, if you could go back in time and talk to him, he just says, I just like sunflowers, damn it. That's why I went out and painted one. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Like, you know, these the pe people are interpreting what they think might be the reason. But unless they had um, notes or something or you know, like sketchbooks or notes or something from the artists themselves, they don't really know. They're just, you know, making an assumption that maybe and it's that. I'm going through an a a, a the, an art, an excellent autobiography of uh, well re, well researched and doc, documented about Van Gogh, and the reason why a lot of his work is, you know, they has so much of this uh, analyst and meaning. Is Van Gogh himself, in his letters to his brother, you know, was trying to explain why he was doing a certain paints because this is at the request of his brother because his brother was trying to sell his art and he needed that information to try and sell his art so and so they're interpreting you know as as to the uh you know the meaning of some of his work when in reality he was just trying to give his brother some clues to help sell his artwork and he and he himself in one of his letters uh says that this is all a bunch of bull crap, but if you insist, if you need it, then I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing with Van Gogh, because because of all those letters, there's a lot of information about the work that he did. But most artists, I, I mean, I don't keep a journal all the time, and I don't know that a lot of them, a lot of artists do. I mean, some some do journals and stuff regularly, but I know I haven't even done a journal at all. That's but you know, you know, when we're all buried and gone. Nobody's going to really know why we painted what we did, <laughs> unless there's something you know specific in a journal or something somewhere. But then, even then, you know, somebody is interpreting your words. Like you might not necessarily, they might not necessarily be doing that the way you were thinking of it. So yeah. I don't know. It's all, it's all conjecture. Yep. <laughs> so, Rafi confirmed, and I hope made Constance feel good. You don't need a meaning behind your artwork. Yeah. Just paint something uh, because you like it. Let's take out. Yeah, yeah, and the other thing is, I mean, artwork, it might mean something, one thing to us painting it, but it might mean something totally different to somebody looking at it, you know, and it, so it's, it's all subjective. Well, and that's part of the, you know, we've talked about before the connection, you know, collectors, yeah. they connect you, uh, you know, inspire or uh, you motivate somebody, uh, uh, to why they like your artwork because it motivates them or brings back a memory of their childhood or, or something in their life. And they, they make it, yeah. you know, that's a whole, di you know, that's a whole different subject. And they don't, the point is they don't need to be told because like you said, what you mean doing it is not necessarily what they interpret, but uh, just let the artwork itself speak for itself. I think that's the best thing. Right. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to the 12 keys to
to create great paintings. Now, for our listeners, because we listen to a lot of Stephen Bauman, you can find him on YouTube, his videos and his podcasts. And um, these are these are his keys. These are what he has come up with. They may not be right. They may not be appropriate because every art teacher, every art coach has their own what they consider is important to creating great artwork. The reason why I like them and follow them because I've actually tried to implement them in my work, and it has improved my work tremendously. Uh, there are other art, art teachers and coaches that are fantastic. I'm not putting them down, but they don't. I don't connect with them. When we talk about connecting with our art, well, I connect with Stefan Bauman. I connect with his teachings, you know, and, every, and everything. So what we're going to do, I I uh, typed them out on a paper. Everybody hear the paper? <laughs> and <laughs> there are 12 of them here. All right. So the first one is concept. And Diane or Constance, one of you want to uh, take that up, talk about that a little bit. How's, how, do, how do you apply that to your work? Diane, I'll let you do that. <laughs> Um, a lot of these things, a lot of the steps you talked about, I had, you know, I went to art school, so I had a lot of the stuff in separate classes, you know, for different things, and then we had to kind of learn how to put it all together, and a lot of the stuff now, I mean, I've been working so long, it's like, it's not, I don't think about a lot of this stuff anymore, it's quite, sort of um, intuitive, you know, after doing it for so long, so I don't even think about some of these things. <laughs> which makes it hard sometimes when I'm trying to explain to somebody else, you know, how to paint. So I do need to kind of step back to, you know, what I learned in college and how they taught us to um, so set up paintings and things. Explain what, what is Stephen Bauman's definition of concept? What, what is he talking about here? Um, I don't remember specifically his definition, but <laughs> okay. I mean... When yeah, when you concept coming up with something to paint, when you're either looking at something that yeah. nature, or you're looking, or you're putting together a, a still life, you know, a setting, it's the concept. The you know, you're going to paint some old shoes, or you're going to paint paint a boat out on on the ocean, or a, a tree with some leaves. That's when he, when he refers to as concept. Just coming up, you got to have a concept in your mind in advance of uh, how you want that painting to come out? Well, I think, I mean, I, I do plein air a lot and I'm out, I don't really, I mean, I'm out in the, in the environment and I don't necessarily go with the idea of painting something specific most of the time. I just walk around until all, something strikes my fancy kind of, and, you know, I'll, I'll, um, something about it just makes me want to paint it. So I guess that's kind of what he's talking about. Um, yeah. But like if you're setting up a still life or something in your studio, there's a little more to it, I guess, than. Um, but what you just described was exactly what he talked about. He says you walk around, he said you're looking for something, you know, the, the, a bush or with the way the light hits it in the shadows. And he said that's, that's the, his definition of, of the concept. So you, you hit it, you hit it, Diane, without even realizing it. See, you're doing this stuff naturally. You don't even realize it. I mean, I'm not, I don't think about it like that. Okay. The next one was uh, focal point. Constance, what's a focal your, point? Your central focal point is what I have written down here. Yeah, um, that when you're doing your painting, and I guess when you're doing your concept, if you're going out plain air painting or still life painting, you look at your arrangement or and s try to figure out well, where is the central focal point going to be, you know, and then, then that's what you kind of aim at and uh, so that your, your painting has a cohesion to it. It's that, that is the point and it's either done with light or shadows to that draws the viewer's eye. You know, you draw the viewer's eye in and then direct their eye around. And that's where he comes across and we'll, 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 we'll like musicians because we can actually control through the next one is composition, which is falls in line with that focal point. The the right. development of the composition and the focal point and the concept is what draws people to your painting. They walk into a museum 
there's a bunch of paintings on the wall and yours is off in the far corner, but you have these, these, you follow these principles really well. They walk over to your painting instead of somebody else's. And he said, that's what makes the, you know, the difference in, in creating a, you know, a great painting. And then the next one is values. And, uh, you two want to take that? What do you mean by values? Well, the values, um, they, they're they easier to see, I think, in a landscape because you have a greater depth than you would in like a still life or something. But um, you can basically see where the foreground is, the middle ground, and the distance. It shows up a lot easier in a, in a landscape than it would in a still life where everything's so close together. I mean, you still yeah. have that in, in any painting, but. Yeah. Um, Not, and, well, number five is color, which are, also goes with values. Cause, can you talk yeah, about so lighter, darker, warmer, cooler, you know, yeah, that kind of. Yeah, that the kind of temperature of the color is, 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 is to establishes with the values, is, you know. So, we're, we, so one, we've got concept, focal point, composition, now values, and color. If you're able to, um, to employ just these five elements, your painting is already on the road to being extremely successful, you know, but thinking about these things as you go will drive you nuts. I tell you folks, they will. <laughs> I I mean, like values. I mean, you can do a painting with just like gray in grays and have your values show up. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. a lot of people use their uh, cell phone nowadays with the, you take a picture and put it in the gray scale. Yeah. And then it'll show you the values. Exactly where they are. And you can see it really very clearly, you know, where the close up far away and the middle ground is. Yep. And then the next Some one. Some people who are purists would say that you really, you know, should, should use the old methods of doing it. But I think that if Monet was alive today and had a iPhone 6 or 7 or whatever that is that could use the grayscale on his phone to get it, I'm sure he would do it. <laughs> Especially <laughs> he would have to take the pictures, you know, because of that seven minute thing that he was talking about, which is very Yeah, well, it does, when you're out in doing plain air, it does help to do the sketches if you're, mm -hmm. to help you remember because the camera doesn't always catch all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, it is better to do a sketch and show your values and your um, blocks of where the color is, make notations. Like, mm -hmm. you know, because things yeah. change so quickly when you're outside. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and that's that's what he said. You, know, you got about seven minutes, six or seven minutes, and then it's gone. There's something mm -hmm. else, you know. So Yeah, you have to remember. <laughs> well, that, and that's his, that's step number 12, you know, hey, memorization. We'll, we'll talk a little bit when we get down to there. Uh, number six is brush strokes. Now, I'll talk about that because I never – really paid attention to brush strokes before until after I started listening to a lot of Stephen Bauman videos and he talks about because I've I've only recently got back into oil painting and it really applies. I've tried, you know, to to use brush strokes with acrylic, but it's like he said, you can't get it. But with uh oil paint, you get that lush put that luscious paint on there. Don't be afraid to put the paint and and uh, take that brush and and uh, by, and I like his example where he says you can take a and put a vertical stroke of one color versus a horizontal stroke, and it will look and reflect the light completely differently. The light mm -hmm. and the shadows, and it's so true. It is. I've discovered that so true. And so your brush strokes very much. Uh, is a, a very important. I used to read about it and I used to watch other videos and other and artists talk about it. And I said, what's the big deal? You know, <laughs> I yeah. really did. I so had look at the Van Gogh's Starry Night. I mean, that's just a, a loaded example of brush strikes. I mean, he's, it's very, that is very brush stroke. Yeah. With the swirls and everything. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, so, I pay a lot more attention to that now. And I like it. Stephen Bauman uses an example. I started to apply. He says, put one stroke down and then don't touch it. And then put another one down, go in a different direction. And the results is incredible. 
Yeah. So for our listeners, our artist listeners here, I truly recommend you pay attention to your breast strokes. All right. Number seven is edges. And that's when he, t- yeah, that goes along with the breast strokes, you know, with the edges, like he said, you put a vertical line and he, he, um, he talks about that the, uh, a, uh, you should paint, you know, preferably from the thin to fat method. You know, you start out with a lot of uh, uh, turpentine or a lot of medium in your paint, and then you build up. And your your edges, your 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 highlight or your focal point paint should be thicker than the other, maybe the background. He said that will give you your depth to your painting, along with giving a little bit of texture. But visually, it enhances it. Diane, you want to add? Add to that or? Uh, <clears throat> on your vocal points they tell you to um, that's where you want your the sharpest edges the um, most contrast between colors and um, more texture that'll all draw the eye to that point so as you get away from that point you want less and less of that until the edges kind of a lot of edges disappear into the background or into whatever's next to them and you know yeah, that's so, right. he gets into what's yeah, called, like, called eye yeah. magnets and draw, and you're you're actually drawing the viewers, you're controlling the viewer's eye. Yeah, Constance, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. What? That's all right, that's all right. Um, he, I remember that Stefan talked about. Um, oh, God, I'm having a senior moment. Uh, Renoir, that he was, and when you look at Renoir's paintings, especially the portraits and stuff, the face is very detailed, and from there out it becomes less and less detailed. I mean, it's a very, it's a very marked, I mean, you can really notice it in his paintings. And, and, uh, and Rembrandt too. He also talked about, you know, Rembrandt that, uh, you know, you go up and it says, if you look at, go up close and look at Rembrandt's painting close, there's, you know, just thick paint everywhere, you know, and, and, and uh, it, look, it looks like a mess up close. So then when you step back, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's beautiful, and that's all with the brush strokes, the edges, the color, the values. It's all those those uh, uh, keys coming into play. Now, the next one is number eight is transitions. Diane, you want to add add what do you think about transitions? What what is transitions, and what what is he talking about? Um, the transition is like when you're say you're going around a uh, apple. So you have a transition from dark to light around, and you're, like, describing the three-dimensionality of the object. So you have a transition of the color all the way around it to, to make it look round. Um, but that applies to any, any object, any shape. Yes, any, yeah, any, any shape you're, try, you're trying to express, you know. It's a, the change in the color. And transitions can, it can go into effect with the, uh, not different color, but with the same color of the temperature and the, va- and, and the value, all the other items above fall into place, you know, with, with that. I like the way he, he put these, these kind of, all these, these items build up on, on top of each other instead of, you know, the ordering is, is, is it's just, it's, it's, if you can keep these in your mind and these are hard people, they're really, really hard. If you can keep them in your mind as you're creating the work of art, your art will come out looking fantastic, but we're not always. Well, I know artists that keep a checklist. So they'll um, paint and, you know, when they think they might be close to being done, they'll look like they'll have a checklist and they'll, they'll actually go down the checklist and see if all those things that they you know, they all apply. If they can see where that's happened. That and is. It helps them idea. to pinpoint. That's you know, an where idea. Where. Since I, since I've got these, I've got these typed out on these <laughs> I got, I got my checklist here. There you go. <laughs> Just, yes. I can put a little thumbtack in the wall, and that way you can, when you're painting, you can when think. I, when I think it's done, when I'm thinking I'm about <laughs> to be done, because that's yeah. a hard, that is the hardest point. I still have a hard time trying to determine. It'll, it'll become second nature after a while, and then what you're, you've got this little recording in your brain going lighter, darker, smaller, you know, and you yeah. just run on those little trigger things that you need to look at through your uh your brain like a little record playing yeah, over absolutely because i i really i have a difficult time determining when it's done 
And sometimes when I think it's not done, I add something to it and I mess it up. <laughs> That's part of the experience. <laughs> I get real scared. I get real scared near the end. It's like, oh my God, I'm going, it's so perfect. I'm going to mess it up. Oh my God. <laughs> You can make it over again. That's the way to look at it. <laughs> All right. Number nine was drawing. And I really what? like how he talked about drawing. He says, most people say, you can actually become a good painter without knowing how to draw. And he talked about, uh, you know, people that use these uh, 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 projectors. projectors. Yeah. And let me tell you what I almost did. All right. Well, was it a couple of weeks ago when I did my first oil painting that I haven't done since I was 17 years old at that same day, when I finally decided I was going, I set up my, my still life and I had everything. I had the, I had the lighting on it. I got the paints ready. And before that I was on Facebook and I saw this little device that they were selling. It was called a draw scope. Oh yeah. And it's like $89. <laughs> I almost was going to buy it. I'm glad I didn't. And what it does, you can take it and look through it at your item and then project it onto, under your, hold it and then look at it on your canvas and then draw around to get, you know, and I almost was going to do that. But I got thinking about it. So I'm glad I didn't buy it because I didn't have the, really didn't have the money. That was the, the key thing. If I'd have had the money, I probably would have bought it, but I'm glad now I didn't buy it and I'll never buy it now because then I happened to look, sat down looking at Stefan about one of his videos and he talks about using your perspective tool. Uh -huh. And so I, you know, I have one and I ordered, you know, I got a cheap plastic one and I used now I had, when I first got it, I tried to use it on photographs and it, you know, holding it up to, to a photograph on the computer or whatever. And, I don't know. It just, it did. I didn't seem to notice the help, but I use the perspective tool according to what he, you know, his directions and how to hold it, how to measure it. You know, I used it on the actual live image. I held it up and had it, you know, set just right. The size on the other end, I wanted on the canvas and I used it and oh my God, it improves so much, you know? So, well, so another gadget, let me show it to you since I'm not tied to the computer. It's, um, I got several of these, but I like this one the best, I think. And this is what it looks like. You see this? Okay. Just what piece? You can look through the, you can look through it with just clear and then you can look through it with just red. This, the red helps you find your values. Okay. Uh, and these have lines in them, grids. So when you're looking through it, you look at through it with a grid. So this is picture perfect three in one viewfinder. I think that's the name of it. But it's I like that one pretty good. Okay. Because what he emphasized instead of because if you use a projector. Projector is like a photograph. It distorts. It distorts the 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 image, and you have some mm -hmm. distortion. And it really, it doesn't help you learn how to draw. And he says you really have to learn how to draw. As you say, you can become a good painter without learning how to draw. But in reality, what you're doing is when you the more that you use a perspective tool, or the more that you practice draw, or that you do sketches, you are in essence you're drawing with your brush. And it just, it uh, will make your art pop out. You mm -hmm. agree with that, Diane? You, uh. um, I think you can get by painting <laughs> and kind of um, fudging it <laughs> without learning really how to draw. But you'll be way ahead if you do learn to draw. If you take the mm -hmm. time to really learn the fundamentals of how to draw. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. And they, it'll save you an enormous amount of time in the long run because yeah. you won't have to keep create uh, correcting mistakes <laughs> you know I mean you not as much anyway I mean you still make mistakes but you know you're you're more accurate much more accurate if you really know how to draw yeah I mean if you get like a small sketchbook and a couple of you know a set of those hard and soft pencils with a, one of those kneaded erasers and just 
I mean, you don't have to go outside to do this. You can draw anything in your house. I mean, take a bottle or a drink bottle or just any, just to practice the drawing part of it, you know. Uh, take something that's really simple at first and then start building yourself up from there, you know. Yeah. So. And that, that led into the uh, number 10, perspective. Mm -hmm. And he went into a, he said, that can be a long discussion. Perspective. You know, but perspective is, is uh, necessary in your pain because it, it gives you depth, gives your pain depth. And, you know, the uh, uh, distance, especially in landscapes, you know, and, and you have your hori horizon line. And I like it, his example when he discussed, uh, in fact, I'm jumping ahead now. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking down here. I'm going, wait a minute. Horizon. Yeah. The number 11 is, is Horizon. And I, I just love that. He held up, took one of the paintings and, and held it up across his eyes. Says, this is my Horizon. Wherever your eye looks, that's the Horizon. Yeah, because his students he would ask us, so where's your horizon? Well, it's uh, kind of behind the mountains over there. Yes. <laughs> it's not necessarily where the sky meets the water. You know? <laughs> it's, it's the horizon is wherever your eyes look, you know, and that applies to setting a still life up in the, you know, in your, mm -hmm. in your studio or going out in plain air. You want to add to that, Diane? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think, you pretty much talked. I mean, he held it in line. He held a, a painting or a, I guess he had a canvas, I guess. He was holding it in line with his eyes. So anything below that you were looking down on and anything above that you were looking up at. So the horizon really is where your eyes are. <laughs> That's like <laughs> a neutral spot. It's so. in how you, and, then how, but, and he uses this discussion of perspective and horizon together when he's doing the paintings of, uh, of goats, mountain goats, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you, uh, see the top of the goat, the backside of the goat, then you're above the goat. If you see the belly of the goat, then you're below the goat. <laughs> and, and, and then the cliffs, you know, uh, the way you look at rocks and things. So, this gives a, a, it's very important to, to consider these when you're, you know, when you're painting, otherwise it just stuff looks kind of flat and, you know. Well, the thing a lot of people end up doing is um, moving the horizon as they're painting or as they're working. You're, you know, like, because they're, they're concentrating on one area and then they'll look at another area and they'll look at it the same way, like from the same angle. And it, it doesn't, it's not really like that. So it, it kind of um, skews the way the painting looks. Exactly, which is, these are concepts you have to have in, in your mind in the planning. And of course, this last one we mentioned before, step number 12 is, our key number 12 is memorization. Because especially when you're outside, if you're outside doing plain air, you know, things change frequently. And taking a photograph doesn't necessarily, you know, it won't look the same. And you have to really have some good memorization and comes into the previous keys of drawing and value and everything. You may want to do some sketches, you know, when you, Diane, when you paint outside, do you, do you take any sketch, do any sketch work in advance or? I used to do a lot, but I don't do it as much anymore. I, I guess it's because my memory's got so much better. Uh, I can, I can remember, you know, what it is about the scene that, that um, struck me in the beginning. And you have to, I mean, I, I look at it, uh, like if I'm gonna paint something, I look at it for a while. And I really analyze it and figure out what it is that, that, that about it that I wanna capture. So I make sure that that is in the painting. And I kind of, I mean, you, you have to work really fast when you're um, plein air painting. And when I do the blocking, I do it pretty fast. Yeah, that was and my, that's basically what I do when I'm doing that. That was my, next, my next question to you was, do, yeah. are you a fast painter when you paint outside? You, you... Well, and the initial blocking is fast. It's very, I mean, I, I, at least for me, I put that down really quickly so that it, because it's going to be, like you said, in seven minutes, it's going to be different. <laughs> you know, okay. shadow, sun moves, the shadows change, you know, wind picks up. I mean, it's all kinds of. 
crazy things outside. So if you want to have um, in your painting what, what it was that you saw initially that you wanted to capture, you need to mark that down on the canvas as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. So, and, and make a note, mental note, a paper note, however you need to note it, so that later, you know, an hour from then, <laughs> you remember what, what it was that you need to get in into the painting. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's, but, I mean, after I get the initial block in down, I don't work as quickly. I take more time. Okay. Yeah, so. So yeah, these these are Stefan Bauman's twelve keys to create great paintings, and I recommend people go to www.talkartpodcast.com. That's talkartpodcast.com, and his video links are there. And watch his video; it's about a thirty minute, forty minute video where he goes through, and he'll, you know, you might want to compare. Did, did we understand? Did we actually learn what he? <laughs> Yeah. He also, he was he was talking about um, Van Gogh, I think it was, for the haystacks. Mm -hmm. How he did a whole series of haystacks every seven minutes. He started another painting, and then he came back the, the next day and worked on that same seven minutes. Was that was that next Van Gogh? Or was that Monet? Monet. Yeah, it was Monet. Monet, I think. Monet. Yeah. Maybe it was Monet. Yeah, he, he, it might have been. He goes real quick, you know. So yeah. he could. He could he mentioned something. I don't know if it was Monet or one of the artists or Rembrandt. One yeah, he and his wife went out. Went out. Well, I think one one thing they used to do haystacks, but they also went on on a in a boat, and they took all the canvases. And he would paint for what is it? Do you say seven minutes or seven yeah. minutes? And then he would change out the canvas and work on. You know, they go out the same time every day. And then he told, then he told a story about. Him. I don't, I don't know if it was Monet or Renoir or one of the, but anyhow, I told a story how he had went and visited this, uh, this park at, at night and it had all, you know, the little boys who were lighting the lamps, you know, the street lamps. And he wanted to do a painting of that. Well, at night, you know, he couldn't, you know, couldn't do it. So he went during the day, but then he, I hired his boys and they actually had, um, uh, to, to come and light the lamps, all right, so he could capture. And they had pieces of, he also wanted to have these lilies in his pond, and he had pieces of paper uh, on sticks to represent the lilies so he could see how the lilies, you know, float in the pond, you know. And <laughs> like he, he, yeah, he created his own still life, but when you look at the painting, you think he was actually there at night painting those, those lamps being lit at night, when in reality it was done during the day. <laughs> A lot of artists that do nocturnes do that. They'll they'll um they'll not they won't do the whole painting, but they'll make notations of where everything is while it's still daylight, mm -hmm. and kind of get the basic drawing of the scene down. And then they can you know once it gets darker, they can fill in the because one as the as you lose the sunlight or even early in the morning, everything is sort of neutral. Yeah, you know it's all kind of the same color or variations of the same color. So the drawing part of it really is what makes the scene more so than yeah. the variations of color. The color, the color is I'm going to do some, yeah, I want to do some sunsets. And so what I thought I would do is since the sun's not going down until around what, 8.30 or so, I could go ahead and get set up. I, can, I was going to do it tonight, but as the wind's blowing so hard here, it wouldn't work. Um, but go ahead and get the easel set up, get the paint out, get the panel on, go ahead and draw the whole the whole thing out. And then as the sun's going and where the sun starts changing colors where I want to paint it, then I'll just go ahead and start painting, fill it up, start, you know, painting it in then. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, I've worked on paintings too. It depends on sizes too, because mm -hmm. the bigger you get outside, the longer that, you know, it takes to paint it. So if, <laughs> trying to get a painting that's large out done outside is difficult because you, the light does change so quickly. So it is it is hard. I mean, you, you almost have to go back, you know, day after day to get it all in there. But you have to um, be aware that 
every day the light is a little bit different. It's not necessarily the same as it was the day before. There might be right. more cloud in the sky or the you know, sky is redder or bluer. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole bunch of variables. That's where your, so, ske- your, your sketches come in and your, uh, your uh, memorization and that. Yeah, yeah, and you have to be aware of all that. Like, you have to remember what you're doing so that you don't now, get everything all mixed up because otherwise it looks our, crazy. For our uh, non-artist listeners, um, the next time when uh, you see a painting that you like, and you want to buy it, and the artist has a price, and oh my God, it's so expensive. This is probably what that artist went through. He tried, to, he or she tried to apply <laughs> these twelve keys, and they had these in their mind when they were trying to apply to create that beautiful piece of work. So, painting is hard. If it was easy, <laughs> everybody would be doing it. <laughs> it's actually hard work if you want to do it properly. If you just want to throw some paint on a canvas, like a you know, and hey, that's there's nothing wrong with that. You know, have fun. But if you are serious about creating serious works of art, great works of art, these are the things that you have to apply on you know, everything. We're about ready to wrap up this episode, but before we end, um, last week. I mentioned, you know, we used to, uh, you know, sit down and try to, like, monthly goals, have a list. And I think we're going to get back to that. But this time, we're going to set, from the three of us, each of us is going to set a goal that we're going to accomplish before next week. And we'll see if we accomplish it. And it can be an artist-related goal. And, Diane, what, what do you think? Your, what's your goal going to be for next week? I've recently moved a bunch of my – um, artwork stuff around, <laughs> so I'm, I need to finish getting that all reorganized so that I can have a better space to work in. So that's what I'm going to work on this week. Okay, Constance, what about you? You got yours? Yes, I'm going to um, do what I talked about earlier with the painting and, and get a plein air painting from yeah, as the sunsets. Sunset. Uh, okay. Yeah. A plain air painting. I just, you know, you have to get all your ducks rowed up so that when the sun starts going down, those seven minutes. Or, Hopefully, you find a windy, a, a non-windy day this week because Oklahoma yeah. wind today. The wind's been blowing like crazy. Yeah, there's a tree behind Wait. behind my apartment. I think it's going to come through the window. It keeps scratching the, the next to the windows. <laughs> We've got tumbleweeds everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> They're all in the door jam. They're all up on the fence and all the light grasses or whatever that, that just the wind's just blown, you know, because they're, I don't know why that they are, but it happened last year too. I went, got up one day and looked outside and there was just, the fence is just covered in this dried grass. <laughs> it's really, I took some photographs. I'll have to put it up. My, my goal for next week, um, Several months ago, or last year, or maybe the year before that, yeah, I was up to doing four or five, maybe six creations of artwork every week. And then I dropped off. And recently, during this COVID-19 crisis, yeah, I've been trying to make myself do where I'm lucky if I get one painting done a week. I want to get back into that. I don't know if I'm going to get six done by next week, but I'm going to get more than one done. So that's my goal, to have at least more, two or more paintings they don't necessarily have to be all oil, all acrylic, or all watercolor. They might be mixed, maybe one watercolor, maybe one oil. But I'm going to uh, get back into uh, creating more works of art on a weekly basis. So you two hold me accountable next week to see if I uh, do a, at least two or more. <laughs> okay? <laughs> well, it depends on how detailed they are. But if you at least work every day instead of letting days go by without yeah. doing anything. That's then the that's point. I've got to work. I got to get back into that. Like I used to working every day. And that's what, you know, I'm making myself get, I've been getting excited with this, you know, oil paint, you know, getting back into the, you know, thanks to Diane, her recommendation for one on oil. It is so great, you know, and I just, it takes a long time for these things to dry though, but <laughs> <laughs> you have, you probably, you're probably using a little bit too much of the oil, the walnut oil. Yeah. It takes a little bit of, you don't have to use very much of it, but it takes a while to um, get used to that. Like, you know, you'll, you'll end up backing off on it a little bit. Yeah. Also, get um, some liquid. It doesn't have that 
strong smell and it it helps things dry faster okay i've discovered that i like it yep and also i'm getting i've got some professional brushes because i told when before we got started folks i told the story of these cheap brushes this last week i was working on this painting and it was a cherries and I had everything just perfect, and I was using this cheap brush, and the hairs came out of it on the paint. Oh, no. That's awful. And I had to pick the hairs off, and, and one of the cherries, I'm lucky that I was able to correct it, but I was screaming and cussing. And then thanks to a recommendation from Diane, or no, Constance, it was Constance who recommended this site, uh, artistbrushes.com, I think that's a site, uh, where you can get, uh, professional brushes for a very reasonable price. I went to that site immediately and I got some professional brushes coming uh, next week. So, uh, yeah, like a brush is what it says. Yeah, I book mean, a brush, yeah. And it, brush. They, they send out a nice variety of brushes. They should. I ordered this year and it's a nice variety of brushes. Yeah. So, I, you know, no more using uh, these cheap Chinese made brushes. I won't. We'll stop there because I'll start cussing. <laughs> yeah, my at least the bristles. Stephen says they're sticks. <laughs> they're no yeah. longer brushes. And like Stephen Bauman says, your brush is like in one of his. He said your brush is like your sword. You got to have a good strong sword. Your sword fighting. Yeah. <laughs> so he says you may you can skimp on the paint, you can skimp a little bit on the canvas, but don't skimp on the brushes. And I've been that's what I've been doing. So now I I am all professional equipment. You know, it's, uh, I'm not skipping anymore. All right. That is, that's going to be it for this episode of the Artist Friends Podcast for June the, Tuesday, June the 9th. And this was episode 49. And I, you've been listening to Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson, and I'm Clyde J. Kale. And thank you so much, folks, for listening. I'm going to say goodnight to Diane, to Constance, and let Diane say goodnight to everybody. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Constance. Good night, everyone. Okay, Constance. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Diane. Good night, everybody. Good night, folks, and thank you so much for listening. Please drop us a thumbs up, however you listen to the podcast, and send us the comments. We appreciate your comments. Bye-bye, folks. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.edsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.